Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is speaking with Eileen Day McCusick. Eileen is a pioneer in the fields of the human biofield, therapeutic sound, and electric health. A researcher, author, inventor, educator, and practitioner, Eileen has been researching health since 1987 and specifically how sound impacts health since 1996. She is the originator of biofield tuning, the founder of the Biofield Tuning Institute, and author of the award-winning, best-selling book, Tuning the Human Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy, as well as her new book, Electric Body, Electric Health. Eileen Day McCusick is a modern-day Renaissance woman. I came across her book, Tuning the Human Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy, several years ago, and it was absolutely fantastic. In fact, I've referred to it many times and still do to this very day. Having studied and practiced multiple forms of sound healing in my career and in my practice, I immediately found her approach both unique and more comprehensive than anything I'd come across yet. Since beginning the practice of Eileen's approach, I've referred a number of my clients to her practitioners around the world and all have reported excellent results. Eileen is the first person to map out storage sites and patterns of information contained within the human biofield the subtle energy layers, and to figure out how to use tuning forks or specific sound frequencies to move, transform, and or clear discordant memories of trauma and energy patterns from our energy field as opposed to sound healing as a means of modulating the energy system. The result, based on my experience of her work, is that instead of being palliative care, Eileen's system produces long-term results and often frees people from traumatic pain patterns and facilitates harmony within their body-mind complex. In this amazing interview, Eileen and I explore such topics as what sound healing is and how it works, her path from being a woman riddled with health challenges to figuring it out for herself, and how that led to the creation of her biofield tuning system of sound healing, an overview of different types and conditions that respond well to sound healing, an understanding of the nature of sound on a grand cosmological scale. Eileen's definition of spirit, soul, consciousness, and a lovely discussion on the primordial sound OM, an exploration of the different levels of our energy bodies and why they respond to sound healing. Eileen shares examples of how memories, emotions, and traumas get stored in our energy field and where specific types of issues are located in our field. Eileen explores bioplasma and what it is, as well as exploring the ether, chakras, and biophotons. We talk about the pioneering research of Fritz Albert Popp. Like many of the great pioneers, Eileen's work is based on her own empirical studies and observations and isn't based on academic theories. She is a very wise, experienced, and skilled woman, and I can't encourage you enough to open your mind to her incredible wisdom. Enjoy my dialogue with Eileen Day McCusick. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very impressive, very exciting guest who I was overjoyed at receiving a confirmation to be on the podcast with which is Eileen Day McCusick, the author of Tuning the Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy. An excellent, excellent book. Eileen, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Great to be here. So Eileen, as you know from our talking together, I've studied your work. I've actually, I bought your DVDs, got your charts, and uh, put your method to work on various patients in the last probably, I don't know, few couple of years at least. I can't remember how long it's been now. But I was actually very, very impressed when I read your book because of the system that you've developed. And so I really wanted to take a chance to share you and your philosophies and your teachings and the beautiful ways that you have developed for helping us understand. One of the things I think your approach does, which we'll get into, is really helps us understand a lot about the human mind and the energy field. So I really enjoyed looking at the differences between your approach and all the others. To begin with, I'd love it if you could give the listeners a working definition of exactly what sound healing is so the listeners are clear what these words or terms mean when you or I are using them. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important to clarify terms. So let's break it down because the word sound actually has two different definitions. 
And that in and of itself can be a little confusing. So one of the definitions of sound is in the context of our own hearing. And the human hearing range is around 20 to 20,000 hertz. So 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And that's one definition of sound. What we as humans hear. Another definition of sound is propagated frequencies of, <clears throat> of, of any kind. So basically propagated waves, whether we call them sound or light or electromagnetism, are all in that category of sound, of waves. And that is reflected in the Vedic saying Nada Brahma, which is all is sound, all is fluctuations of waves. So in, in sound healing, we make use of sound in the audible spectrum, but also in the inaudible spectrum. Uh, certainly my work with tuning forks, the tuning forks produce tones that we hear, but also frequencies in the inaudible range that are interacting with the body. And the word healing means to, to make whole, to make whole. And so in sound healing, we are using sound in order to help us to experience our own wholeness. Well, I love that encapsulation. I love the differentiation between audible sound and sound. And I also love it because your conception of sound beyond the audible is in total harmony with the Sufi tradition. The Sufi tradition, uh, Hazrat Inyat Khan, who I've studied quite extensively, uh, in, in the Sufi philosophy, they describe sound as the all-encompassing term for all frequencies that create uh, the universe or existence itself. So I think uh, that's a really important distinction, and, and that will lend itself to some of our dialogue as we go through. Because a lot of my guests won't know who you are, although some of them do, by the way, some of them um, are my students or my own clients and patients who I have actually referred a few of them to your sound healing practitioners at various locations around the world. So some of them definitely will know you. I have spoken of your work in many of my classes at the Institute, but I'd love it if you could share a biographical overview of the events and experiences in your life that ultimately led you to exploring and mastering sound healing. Sure. Well, like many people who end up in this field that both you and I are in, Paul, I was driven by my own desire to be healthy. And that journey started when I was 18 years old. I had become bulimic when I was 17. And when I was 18, I tried to stop. And I discovered that I couldn't. I, I had come mm -hmm. caught in the grips of a very difficult and shameful addiction. And <clears throat> it was very hard to get over it. And I started, I went on a journey. I started reading self-help books back in the late 80s. And uh, I, I was, I've always been a reader. I was very much a, a geek as a child. I skipped a couple grades, just kind of a bit of a brainiac and uh, very inclined to have my nose in a book. And then prior to that, I had only read fiction, but I sort of dove into nonfiction in the health and healing, human potential, spirituality, that whole genre. And I took a, a very deep dive with the intention of overcoming my addiction, which I succeeded. Um, by the time I was 20, I had overcome bulimia by learning, by basically learning two things. That one, that I had been programmed by my culture into that behavior. That as young women, we have two signs in our culture held up to us. And one is consume and the other is be skinny. And I'm what I call a bothist. Uh, I'm a Libra. I have a tendency to always look at all sides that I can look at. And, you know, I have a Mac and a PC. Uh, I get the fries and the salad. <laughs> and, um, and so bulimia was a logical way for a bothist to, to 
follow both rules to consume and be skinny. And so it dawned on me that addiction and that behavior had been sort of externally programmed and that, you know, so that made me feel a little bit better about myself and my addiction, realizing that my environment had given rise to the sickness. The other thing that I realized that it was my hand and it was my mouth. And if I didn't have control over myself, then who or what did? And I realized that I, it was my responsibility, my health, my well-being was my responsibility and that I was the only one who could create that for myself, that nobody was going to come along and save me, that the ultimate responsibility lay with me. And so I, you know, I, I did overcome the bulimia, but I was also terrifically addicted to sugar and ended up suffering the consequences of uh, excessive sugar intake, which was candida, became really overrun with candida and all the symptoms that go with that and the brain fog and overweight and, you know, just, just low energy. And so I started to try to overcome my sugar addiction and that, that sure wasn't easy. You know, that's a super big addiction that so many people struggle with and it, and it, and it, ended up taking me decades, honestly, to completely overcome that addiction. Uh, But, but there was a lot of other, I don't know, discontent. I I think that I found that the culture and my education had made me feel broken, powerless, weak. I had the belief that, you know, that nobody can make a difference. Uh, I was very depressed. I think I also felt very splintered inside. Like I felt like I had multiple parts of my personality and no sense of centered wholeness. And so this journey towards wholeness and towards healing uh, just kept me going through book after book and different programs. I ended up going to massage therapy school uh, as an, as a sort of entry point into holistic healing. And a part of me wanted to go become a naturopath but there's an awful lot of school involved in that. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do that. So I started in massage therapy school and, you know, Paul, you can probably relate to this. And I imagine a lot of your listeners too, but when you're a researcher, one book leads to another and another. (laughs) I have a very big library, Eileen. (laughs) Exactly. So we tend to go down these rabbit holes. And I think I had read Deepak Chopra's book, quantum healing when it first came out and got introduced to the idea that everything was vibration, you know, cause we're so raised to look at everything as things and solid and separate. And so this whole idea of everything just being fluctuations in a quantum field of potential, um, it was sort of a revelation to me. And then uh, sound healing came across my radar and I, I honestly don't know exactly what led to it, but I ended up with a book called the use of color, sound and healing, uh, color, sound and music in healing. And after I read that, it was just very logical to me. If, if everything is vibration and we as humans are vibration, then treating vibration with vibration seemed very elegant and just made a lot of sense to me. And so I found everything I could back in, that was in 96, and every book I could on the topic. And then I got a catalog from Gaia in the mail that had a set of tuning forks for healing in it. And I ordered them on impulse and had a few clients in my massage therapy practice. It was just a part-time practice. I also owned a restaurant. And I started experimenting with the tuning forks with them. And right off the bat, I was completely fascinated because the tuning forks didn't behave the way I thought that they were going to behave. And I made a lot of really curious observations and surprising observations um, that actually, you know, led me to still be playing with them 25 years later. (laughs) So Uh they've taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Good companion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's very fascinating. Who was the author of the book, The Use of Color, Sound, and Music, and Healing? I think that it was John Bolyu. I think that that was John oh. Bolyu's first book. Okay, yeah, I've st- I might even have it in my library. I'm always interested in those types of things. It, it's uh, amazing how our 
challenges are often the very doorway to our our path, our our uh, our dharma, or our our uh, our genius, and how we're meant to become a support for others in the world through mastering our own challenges and then having authentic experience that we can lead others with. Definitely. I, I definitely felt that, that, you know, my suffering was an inroad into all of the discoveries that I've made and the ways that I've been able to help other people through this work. Yes. I'd love it if you could paint the big picture of sound and its relationship to our origins from a universe, multiverse, or omniverse perspective, and how you feel that sound relates to spirit and what your definition of that is soul and your definition of that consciousness and what you define that as. And then finally, in this list of potentially deep questions is Om, because in the Hindu tradition, it's known to be the sound that creates the universe. And I'd love it if you could share your conception of Om and how that relates to your philosophy of sound and sound healing. And what do you feel the frequency range of Om is? So, you know, just go ahead and unfold <laughs> that at your own pace. And, and I would, but because I, I think these things lay the foundation, and the reason I'm asking you these questions up front is because I want to try to help people understand sound from a bigger picture, because if we understand how sound correlates to spirit, soul, consciousness, and issues of OM, then I think we learn something about ourselves because what we are is an expression of spirit, soul, consciousness, and OM. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, there's so many different ways to unpack that very broad question that you just asked me, Paul. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is cymatics. And what cymatics is, is the study of waveforms. The first time I ever saw a cymatics video, it totally blew my mind. It, it just me, me it, too. <laughs> I love cymatics. <laughs> yeah, complete mind blown kind of thing. Because, you know, the Vedic philosophy, other philosophies talk about how the sound current underlies all of creation. And when you watch a cymatics video, the classic ones by Hans Jenny that were made, I think, in the 70s, he has magnetic particles being activated by sound. And as long as the the frequency is being fed into these magnetic particles, they, they're they all jumping around and dancing and moving. And then as soon as the sound stops, they just collapse. And you really see in that this evidence of how all form arises and moves through sound, through vibration, and that that is life itself. That's what we call electricity, what we call sound, what we call movement, what we call the life force is this dancing aliveness created by the sound current. <clears throat> and so um, if, if, you, if you're listening and you have never, if this is the first time you've heard of climatics, I just invite you to go to YouTube and watch some different climatic videos. And there are different ways to produce climatic images. Uh, a very simple way is on uh, what's called a chladni plate, which is a flat black metal plate, and they place salt or sand on it. And then you can either rub, a, I've seen people rub like a bow for like a violin on the plate, and that creates a resonance that cause patterns to form. Or you can place a, a speaker underneath it and, and use a tone generator to generate specific frequencies. And every frequency that you generate will produce a different pattern on the plate. So that's pretty mind blowing that every single frequency has a pattern of, that is created. <clears throat> also, John Stuart Reed invented the cymoscope, which uses water and puts tone into water. I, I had John make me a few little video clips of some of the tuning forks that I've created because I wanted to see what they looked like in the cymoscope. And so on my YouTube channel, which is just uh, YouTube and then my name, Eileen McCusick, uh, you can see what <clears throat> some of my different tuning forks look like. There's one that's 93.96 hertz. There's one that's 89 hertz and 144 hertz. 
And then the two of those together, which are part of the Fibonacci sequence, those are the 11th and 12th positions in the Fibonacci sequence. And so together they make phi, uh, the golden mean or the golden ratio. And you see this in the cymatic glyph. So, <clears throat> so I think cymatics is just a great way to kind of open your mind to what sound has the power to do. And if you look at the way that sound affects water and you think that our body is mostly water, then sound waves of coming into contact with our body are going to inform the structure and the expression of the water in our body. And that's true if you think about, you know, your, your raging alcoholic father yelling at you and how that sound impacts your, the water in your body versus music, beautiful music or specific tones created just for healing and how that affects you. The way that we feel is extremely determined by what kind of sounds are going on in our environment. Many people tell me they don't have time to eat well or can't afford organic foods. And I ask them how much time and money they've spent seeing doctors, sitting in waiting rooms, and standing in lines at drugstores. I also ask them if they realize that research shows that the average person or animal eating organic foods tends to reach satiation about 30% sooner than those consuming commercial foods, which means you don't need to consume as much food on an organic diet, not to mention the increased toxicity gained from consuming commercial foods. One of my first suggestions is to try Organifi's juice mixes. Organifi green juice nourishes, energizes, and detoxifies the body. Organifi red juice helps increase energy naturally, enhances fat metabolism, and slows the aging process as part of a holistic lifestyle. Organifi gold induces calmness, relaxation, and aids recovery from stress and exercise. But Organifi offers you many more amazing certified organic products as well, ranging from excellent protein powders to skin support to liver detoxification to inflammation control and joint support to critical immune, which is designed specifically to enhance immune function. Why wait to be healthy when you can start now and create your own vitality account within your own body? After all, your body is your temple and the health of your body has a direct impact on your mood and mental performance day in and day out. My family, clients, and I love Organifi, and I know you will too. To get your Living 4D with Paul Check 20% discount on any of the amazing Organifi products, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com, and on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, that's CHECK20 in caps, and you and your family will be happier and healthier than ever. Enjoy. I just wanted to uh, mention to the listeners, if they haven't looked at Masaru Emoto's books showing the effects of thoughts on water crystal formation, that's an, a great one. And are you familiar with Harold Saxon Burr's book? Uh, which one am I thinking of? Blueprint for Immortality? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yes. Well, I'm in his sure. book, you don't know that one. It's a phenomenal book. But uh, just to to sort of support your point here, it was a he did this study in 1947 at Yale University, which even if it was done today would blow people's minds. And I want to share it with you if you're not familiar with it. He took plants of the same genus. He broke them into two s- groups of seeds, potted them. And then he had students in his university classes uh, fill mason jars with just tap water, normal water, and hold on to them, you know, and keep contact with them for, I think, three or four hours. Then he took jars of water, mason jars of water to a psych ward and had psychically ill people interact with them. Then he watered one group of plants with the water that his students interacted with and another group of plants with the water the psychically ill people interacted with. And the pictures he shows of the difference in those plants is quite mind-blowing. Wow. 
That's a brilliant experiment, actually. <laughs> uh, well, what's what's really amazing is that was 1947, and still to this very day, as a guy who has spoken to countless geniuses and people like yourself, hardly anybody knows about but, about that. But it's beautiful, and it's in the book Blueprint for Immortality by Harold Saxon Burr. And another thing is, I don't know if you know about this, but I was scanning the web for something and happened to come across this cymatics video by a professor that figured out which frequencies to use to create a human face. And his what video up? shows water turning into, I think it was water, into a human face that is unbelievably like a human face. I mean, it's like someone painted it and he did it with vibration. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, if that doesn't show you, you know, about the sound current underlying creation, I don't know what does. No, I was shocked when I found it. I watched it about five times because it was just so mind blowing. And I wish I could remember the guy's name, but, uh, you know, it was one of those things where I was probably really busy and just thought, holy shit, if that doesn't tell a story, then people are dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see that link. If I come across it again, I'll email a link to yeah, you. Yeah. That, Cause that sounds like a very powerful image to help, you know, to get this point to sink in. Uh, because if you've never been exposed to this information, it is a little, it's, it is a little mind blowing. And so it's good to, to have visuals like that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for interjecting, but because the uh, issues I wanted to share were right relevant to that, I wanted to catch you before you got into spirit, soul, consciousness, and ohm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, please do interject that. Those are both wonderful things to hear. So soul and spirit, I, I talk about that in, in tuning the human biofield. And part of my discovery along this path because you know the rabbit hole is very deep <laughs> and, yeah wormhole it's a wormhole <laughs> and and i've you know gone so much deeper in it than i ever anticipated i would you know i set out on this journey when i was 18 because because i wanted to look good in a bikini quite frankly <laughs> that was that was my motivation was really vanity and it took, um, you know, it took a really a lot longer. I, I thought it was going to take 30 days and cost $30. And, and it actually took more like 30 years and <laughs> many, many more thousands of dollars to, to figure out all of the different things that were in the way of really embodying true health. And it turned out that there was, there was a mountain of stuff in the way, uh, including my own suppressed emotions. And also a lot of misinformation from my environment. What I discovered was that we're really kind of kept in the dark, literally, about our own biological nature and, and about electricity and plasma and ether. <laughs> I, this, I, discovered, I discovered that there are actually two more states of matter than what I learned about in school. I learned about solid, liquid, and gas. And while I was in that paradigm of solid, liquid, and gas, despite decades of study and tons of money and time spent, in back in 2010, right before I discovered plasma, I was still broke. I was still sick. I was still tired. I was still vaguely depressed. And, and it wasn't for lack of trying <laughs> to be none of those things, but none of the promises that people had made to me delivered. And maybe they delivered for other people, but they didn't for me. And so I was still in that position of seeker. And then I discovered my son actually came to dinner one night, and this was very good timing. Because I had started, I'd gone to school as an adult in order to seek to understand the phenomena that I had been encountering for the previous 10 years with my tuning forks working on people. I had discovered that if I moved a tuning fork from six feet away towards somebody's body, 
that I would I was going through an atmosphere that had areas where there was a density where it felt like there was actual charge present. It was the best word that I could describe it. It would feel like I had actually encountered some mass or substance and and I was actually able when I encountered these areas of density, I found that I was able to break them up and also move them with my tuning fork. And so I had these two burning questions of what is this stuff that I'm encountering in the atmosphere around people's bodies? And what law of physics is governing the fact that I can move this stuff with a vibrating tuning fork? And I really wanted to understand this because it was... And not only did I want to understand it, but what I had found, I I worked directly over the body and on the body for 10 years, but then sort of accidentally discovered the same phenomenon that I found over the body in the atmosphere around the body. And when I started working out in what I now call the biofield, I started to have very dramatic therapeutic outcomes with my clients very dramatic. The people who had pain for 30 years, gone in one session. People who had massive anxiety, gone in one session. Uh, You know, certainly those are, that doesn't happen with everybody, but it was, it was happening and it was very dramatic. And I realized that this is the kind of outcome that people are looking for. (laughs) This is the kind of healing that people want. And yet, you know, back in the 90s, when I first picked up the tuning forks, if I told somebody that I was doing sound healing with tuning forks, there's just something about that, right? That has just this ring of woo <laughs> to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's hippie. They think it's hippie stuff. Yeah, total hippie, dippy, you know, and, and airy, fairy, new age, crystal packing, whatever. And and I'm not like that. You know, I'm very grounded. I'm very practical. I'm very logical. And and so it it honestly pained me <laughs> to tell people what I was doing because I would meet with these skeptical responses. And so when these outcomes became very dramatic, I I received guidance from the universe, came in very loud and clear. And it told me that I needed to go to school, I needed to get degrees, I needed to learn and teach about sound, I needed to advance science, the science of sound healing, and also what I now know as biofield science, um, out into the world, and that I needed to cover the globe with this method. And, you know, that was, it was a clear message. And I was like, okay, you know, (laughs) I'll do this. So I went to college as an adult to get degrees. So I was in the process of trying to answer those questions, you know, what is this stuff and and how is it moving? When my son came to the dinner table one night and he said to me, did you know there's a fourth state of matter called plasma? And I was like, hmm, solid, liquid, gas. No, like somehow I missed an entire state of matter. And, And then later on in the conversation, we were talking about the nature of space and space being an empty vacuum. And, and I said, you know, I think I read somewhere once that space actually is not the empty vacuum. We've all been told that it is. And my husband was like, bah, space is an empty vacuum. And so after dinner, I sat down and I searched, space is not an empty vacuum. And what came up was plasma. And that sent me down the plasma rabbit hole. And in the next four months, I I learned everything I could about the fourth state of matter. I discovered electric universe theory and Wal Thornhill, who I know you've had as a guest. I read Don Scott book, um, the electric sky, which completely blew my mind. And actually I cite that particular book as the self-help book to end all self-help books for me. And it's not a self-help book at all. What it is, is it's a brilliant academic explanation of the electric force in space and how we've been taught that it's a vacuum and that it's gravity driven, but plasma cosmology and these fellows in the electric universe group have observed and described that it's all electric, that the sun isn't this hot gas. It is an electric plasma and the solar wind isn't a hot gas blowing at us. It's it's electrically charged particles so that when we get a coronal mass ejection that hits our upper atmosphere, 
it takes the plasma that's in dark current mode and changes it to glow mode. And so we get northern lights. So, so everything that's going on in the heavens is all plasma. But then I discovered that it's everywhere. It's completely ubiquitous. And, and that it's also in our own bodies as what I would call a bioplasma. We are electrical beings. We have an electric current running through us. And anything that has an electric current running through it has a magnetic field around it. What Harold Saxton Burr called L fields or life fields. You, you know, you can't separate the magnetic field from the electric current. And so I've really come to see our human biofield as our plasma electric expression. And that this is the same thing that we would call our soul. And if you think about the, the electrical nature of the body, the digestive fire or passion or a, a soul singer who's really fiery, you see that plasma body, that fire in action. And so I would say that, that there's a certain uh, consciousness to, to plasma and to electricity. Uh, Hannes Alphen, who is one of the, the people who really studied it, um, observed that it had lifelike behavior in the lab. And just like sound currents give rise to life, this combination of sound plus electricity uh, gives us pattern and movement and aliveness and consciousness. Um, so so this, this state of matter of plasma and the bioplasma of the human soul, but the, when we go into spirit, I discovered that there was also another state of matter that I hadn't learned about, and that is the state of matter of ether. Have you ever had anybody on your show talk about ether, Paul? Oh, uh, let's see. I think I might have touched on it with Walt Thornhill a little bit. Yes, I did. Um, but I haven't had too many people. Uh, I think part of the problem, as you know, with ether is that it's still locked into the collective unconscious that it doesn't exist because of the Michelson Morley experiment. Um, I've studied it quite a lot, and that's one of the reasons I put it in our our uh, podcast notes. Uh, and I'm anxious and excited to hear what you have to share about it. But before I move forward, I have to ask you, are you familiar with the French physicist Jean Charon's work? No. French, uh, the French physicist Jean Charon was a, um, he was an associate of Albert Einstein, except he was much more oriented in himself toward the spiritual. And he wrote a couple of books. One of them is called Spirit and Matter. I think you'd find it quite fascinating. Basically, he took Einstein's theory of relativity and applied it spiritually and puts forth a pretty comprehensive, logical, and interesting model suggesting that electrons actually have consciousness and that they have an inner space in which they record every experience that they ever have and really does a very interesting job of showing that what we call spirit and even how it relates to soul links right to electrons. So without going through that, I would just love to say to you, search Jean Charon, C-H-A-R-I-O-N, J-E-A-N Charon. His books aren't easy to find, but there are two of them. Spirit and Matter, I think, was his first one. There's a newer one. I've read them both. I don't tell them about them, uh, a lot of people about them, because they are quite deep, and most people don't have the background and the in sciences to really follow them, but I think I would pay money to hear what your response is after reading them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's great. I'm always interested in finding resources like that. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are 
and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 to save 15%. You know, as far as electrons recording information, what I discovered about the biofield was that, you know, we've been told that our memories are in our brain and we just kind of accept that. However, the brain is really mostly fat. And and where in nature do we see information stored in, in fat? <laughs> we don't, but <laughs> just calories. <laughs> Yeah, and toxins, <laughs> calories and toxins. <laughs> yeah, uh, but certainly, you know, not things like memories that are retrievable. You know, we can pull information from silicon or uh, certainly water. But um, but this fat thing is a bit curious. But I started really thinking about it, and the the biofield, the bo- the the electromagnetic system of the body is really the vehicle through which we experience our life. Everything that we see gets translated into electromagnetic signaling in the brain. Everything we hear, everything we smell, everything we touch and taste is all recorded electromagnetically. So it would make sense that all of our memories are stored in our body's electromagnetic system. And we see lots of evidence of information being stored magnetically. What my research is sort of a blind fumble in the dark for many years, but but what it revealed was that there appear to be standing waves in the body's biofield, the, the biofield being shaped like a torus. So a torus is a sphere with a spiral channel down the middle. A donut, basically, for those that don't know. Yeah, like a fat donut. And, and that that in the space between the body and the outer boundary, which is around on average six feet in most people, that our memories appear to be stored in standing waves in this container of our own biofields. And so when I do a a biofield tuning session on someone, I start at the outer boundary of their field, which holds the record of conception, gestation, and then birth. And it's like dropping a needle on an album and reading the vibrational record of a person's life in these standing waves. So I'm able to put you on the table, Paul, and go through your field and tell you everything about you. I can tell you ages where you've had sadness, where you've had anger, where you've broken a bone or had an accident. You had a head injury when you were five. Your mom has this personality. Um, you're, you tend to worry about the future. All of these patterns of information are in your biofield. And my research has been both decoding the anatomy and the physiology of this field and the language of vibration that everything is encoded in. So we are, you know, we are a walking we have a cloud storage system around us. And, you know, we were walking along with our whole life experience recorded in our electromagnetic body and, and our current feelings and our current expression. So, so that is the, the plasma aspect, the electrical aspect of, of our being. Now, when it comes to ether and this idea that ether has been debunked, and that that is what we are all walking around with this idea of space as an empty vacuum. <clears throat> and we're also told 
that that space is empty, right? Nothing there. And electromagnetic waves, so the light we see coming from the sun, does not require a medium to move through. So we're told that these waves of light can travel through nothing because they don't require a medium. Whereas previously people believed in the luminiferous ether, the uh, very sort of the ground state of the work of Tesla and, and many of the early explorers of electricity was the understanding of this medium, this dielectric medium, this ocean of clear light and pure potential that waves arise in and travel through. So it's, it's an incredibly connective medium. It's the idea that everything arises from this ground state of pure potential. Um, it's what people like Nassim Haramine call the zero point field. Part of what's confusing about this concept is that it has a lot of different names. And even, even the, the description of the Higgs field, where the Higgs boson comes from, the description of that sounds an awful lot like ether. It's a field that's present everywhere that what we see as matter arises from. It's the same definition of the ether. Yes, I think it's it's a very, very important thing to understand. And I don't know if you're aware, but uh, I was watching Greg Braden's show. I think it was series three, uh, third, the third uh, round of it. And he cited two current research papers, one from the United States Air Force and one from another source who had redone Michelson Morley's experiment with much more advanced instrumentation and indeed proved that the ether does exist. But unfortunately we don't hear about that. Exactly. There's a lot of research coming out that really supports this. And I found numerous articles about how the ether is making a comeback. And so if we, if we put ether and plasma into our cosmological picture, all of a sudden we have introduced connectivity and light. Because the cosmological story that we're told is one of darkness and disconnection. In the beginning, there was nothing which exploded for no reason. It's all random chaos. There's only entropy. It's all dark, dark black holes, dark energy, dark matter, and it's all going down. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> how, how exciting. <laughs> Let me go to school to learn more of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so when I discovered plasma and I read The Electric Sky, what I realized was that the reason why I had this low-grade depression and angst and discomfort that wouldn't go away was because I was literally missing the light and missing the truth of the light about our own biological illumination from within our own electric body. And that the, the same light that makes us alive is the same light that powers the sun and the stars, that, that, it, that it's all one light and it's all arising from one field. And as soon as this cosmology of light and connection started dawning on me, my whole life began to change. And with the introduction of these two new states of matter to explore and to make use of, I started to be able to solve the problems that I wasn't able to solve in the separate world of solid, liquid, and gas. That that you were becoming illuminated. <laughs> exactly, I was becoming illuminated, and that's what happened. The sort of light of all of this reality that had been hidden started to dawn on me. And it completely changed the way that I approach problem solving and, and just my own inner experience. I felt a visceral sense of connectivity to creation that had been missing up until that point because the yogis will tell us all is one. But then my education and you know current popular science was telling me everything is separate and dark and falling apart. And I couldn't. Well, now, now you know who to listen to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so discovering plasma and electric universe was a way to reconcile those two parts of my brain. Um, have you studied Plotinus at all? No. Ah, Plotinus was a Greek philosopher 
who 2,370 something years ago stated clearly in his teachings, what you call the vacuum is not a vacuum. It is equally a plenum and is the source of all that is. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah, it's a plenum and it is the source of all that is. Absolutely. And this could also be called the Akasha or the Akashic record because part of the quality of the ether is that it it mem- it's like a universal hard drive that records every single keystroke. And so it contains the information of everything that ever is, was, or will ever be exists within the ether. I have a question if I could. Have you studied much of Irvin Laszlo's work? Only a little bit. In I can't remember exactly which of his books. I think a science in the Akashic field. He describes space as being 800 times more dense than steel with a friction coefficient of zero. Have you ever found anything on the density of space? Yeah, Tesla actually talks about that too. And and Tesla was saying that light has to be a longitudinal wave in the ether because it's so it's actually so solid. And when I read that, it made me think about how powerful we must be as humans to be able to overcome it. Well, I think that's the friction coefficient of zero, and that's one of the points he makes. The reason we don't notice it is because there's a zero drag. If you have a zero friction coefficient, then, you know, it sort of makes me think when I look at what he says and what Nassim Harriman is saying and looking at emergence at the Planck scale, that what emerges from the zero point field and produces what we know of as space, which we could refer to here as the ether, is actually like a, a superfluid, like you have in uh, physics and quantum physics. And the fact that it's so dense means, you know, one of the examples I give my students is why do you pack billiard balls so tight when you rack them to start a pool game? And everybody knows because they break better, they explode better when you hit them with the cue. I say, now imagine if your cue balls were 800 times more dense than steel, had a friction coefficient of zero. If you hit the cue into those balls, you'd have the ultimate scatter because the intensity of that contact would be so high. And why I was exploring this and why this is so important is because it immediately lends support for things like the speed of thought and action at a distance and the butterfly effect. Because if we're all basically in an ocean of ether that's 800 times more dense than steel, then even batting our eyelid would actually affect every single part of the universe contained in space. Absolutely, because it's all one thing. And what goes on in one realm affects what's going on in in another. Um, Wall Wall has a great definition of the word energy about how it's the relationship of, of all the matter in the universe to all the other matter in the universe that it's all one big movement <laughs> in through one thing and it's all connected. And it's, it's the understanding of ether and, and the essential unity of everything to me that explains distant healing because we do biofield tuning at a distance. And so how does that work? Because according to our standard cosmology, it should be impossible But if you put ether into the equation, it's just a very logical explanation of resonance in the ether because this little bit of square inch of space in front of me contains the information of everything now, right here, and I can access it. I can stick a fork. I can imagine a hologram of a person and I can approach this imaginary hologram and my tuning fork will reflect the information present in their field in that moment. And it doesn't matter whether they're downstairs or whether they are on the other side of the planet. 
I can get instantaneous information and instantaneous state shifting through doing distance sessions, working through the ether. Yes. This, are you familiar with David Bohm's concept of the hollow movement? Yes. Yeah. So it's a long, this is all sort of speaking of the same thing with different words, but talking about the same reality. And speaking of what you were just talking about, you know, I do a lot of distance work, so none of this is a surprise to me, but it's interesting in my studies of shamanism and and the structure stages of consciousness, I came across various books uh, showing diagrams that shaman had made when they went into trance to try to find where the animals are for the hunters. And in every single case, they showed the shaman's map showed where the animals would be, and it was exactly where the the uh, tribal hunters found the animals and got the kill every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they could tap into the ether and see. That information is there. And it's there for anybody to tap into and get information from. It's, it's not that hard to do. You know, there's many different approaches towards accessing the information in the ether. Yes, there is one caveat I'd like to throw in there, though, because I do this work all the time. You have to have the spiritual courage to handle more truth within yourself or your ego and your shadow and your fear based biases will block you from seeing what's available to all of us at any given time. And having had a number of very profound and deep experiences of emergence into the collective unconscious. I can tell you that you come face to face with a very powerful mix of the darkest evils and the greatest pains and the greatest highs and the greatest joys of humanity, and they can happen at the same time, and it can literally feel like you're being struck by a bolt of lightning. So I believe that all the information is available to us, but I don't think there's that many people out there that are mature enough spiritually to handle that much truth. And I think that's what the real limitation is. Absolutely. About handling it, but also trusting the impressions you get, understanding. You know, just like one of the ways that I use the ether is that if I'm doing a distance session on a client, certainly using the ether that way, uh, but sometimes I'll get a sense that there is some for example, supplement or herb that they need. And so I'm not trained as a, as a nutritionist or an herbalist. I really know very little about these things, but it will come to me. I'll ask the ether if there is something that this person needs and it will come to me. It will just drop in what I call my mail slot, which is the Alta major chakra where the Atlas bone joins the skull just under the occipit ridge. Um, and there's a minor chakra there called the Alta Major, which is also known as the Mouth of God. And I didn't know that it had a name. All I knew is that I had a sense that I had a little trap door there and that sometimes a little trap door would open and notes would drop in and they would, because like come from, comes from the ether and it would give me instruction or tell me what to do. And so what will happen is, you know, this particular herb or this particular thing will just drop in and then I'll look it up. And it will be exactly what the person needs for whatever they have going on. So, you know, there's ways to access it in these little tiny bits and pieces uh, where the information is there, where we aren't necessarily blowing our minds with the whole incredible scope of, of every single wild, extreme human emotion that's ever been reported. No, no, but, but, but at that same time, though, as you have alluded to, a person has to be evolved enough to trust the message, um, even if it's a herb or a suggestion for somebody, um, which takes enough spiritual development to realize that what we call soul and spirit is actually real and is more reliable than our education system or our ego's programming. Absolutely. And I think... Part of being able to hear and understand, to discern those messages has to do with the signal to noise ratio in our own electrical system. Many of us are really full of noise and noise from our our bad educational system that really taught us a lot of falsehoods. 
uh, noise from trauma and abuse and false beliefs and false stories and drama. There's many, many forces and sounds and information that we're subjected to that make our electrical system full of static. And what biofield tuning does is it works with the premise that the body is a self-tuning instrument and that when the body hears its own noise, it will cl- it will auto-tune. It will basically restore itself to whatever degree it can to what I call our factory settings. You know, Bioptimizers makes an amazing product called P3OM, which is a prebiotic product and it's amazing for uh, not only helping uh, repopulate the gut with uh, friendly bacteria but as Wade will tell you it's really really an amazing uh, product in case you ever feel like you're getting any kind of food poisoning or illness coming on and Wade's right here with me and he's the co-founder by Optimizers and he knows more about P3OM than anybody But I can tell you this, I've had nothing but excellent results and nothing but positive feedback from all my clients and friends that I've turned on on to P3OM. So Wade, tell us a little bit about P3OM and and why it works so well. Well, P3OM is, we call it the Navy SEAL of probiotics. Amen. Basically, its job is to kick out the bad guys in your body. Uh, Food poisoning is one of those things from bad bacteria. What we've done is we've taken an aggressive strain of L. plantarum. We put it into toxic soup, ran a sine wave to keep a few of them alive. And the few survivors, we grow on very specialized medium to make a cultured, patented enzyme that has extraordinary powers. Uh, Number one, it survives the intestinal tract. Yes. And number two, it is absolutely hunts down uh, pathogens in in the body, bacteria, viruses, these type of things. And this is really where the future of probiotics is. It is about developing and culturing and creating super strains of probiotic, very much like the Navy SEALs go through a training and these yes. individuals mm-hmm. have extraordinary powers to deal with chaos. And in today's world where we want to improve our immunity and our function and our gut health, p through m is head and shoulders above any probiotic out there. So my understanding is it can be used daily as a supplement, but it can also be used in larger quantities as a defense measure. We've tested this uh, literally with over a hundred of our friends who have been suffering from various times of food poisoning and a handful of those guys, when you're in food poisoning and within 20 to 30 minutes, you complete recovery. That's awesome. And I've, I've uh, seen it happen myself. Angie has felt bad a number of times and uh, several of people in the, in the house or family have, and I say, take 10 if that doesn't feel good in an hour, take 20. And you've told me you can't overdose on them, which is amazing. Yeah, that's the beauty of p m You can't take too much. They'll fight off the bad guys and uh, they'll get your digestion rocking and rolling the way it should. So if you want to have a healthy gut and you want some defense, carry P3OM with you wherever you go, airplanes, cars, business meetings, hotels, conferences, and you've got your Navy SEALs in the bottle and they're ready for you anytime. Wade, how do we, we get a hold of your amazing P3OM product? Super easy. Just go to www.bioptimizers.com slash living4d and put in Paul10 for your 10% discount code. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com slash living4d and Paul 10 for your discount code. You got it. There you go. Try it. You'll love it. I use them. I can't tell you enough how much I love this product. I think it's a genius product and you've heard it right from the master himself. Get your P3OM. Let us know how you feel about it. Lots of love. Over the years, as I've received tuning, um, I started receiving tuning from my first students back in 2010. And that was the same year that I discovered plasma and, and really kind of where my life hit bottom in a lot of ways, but also really turned around. And receiving tuning has helped to get the noise out of my signal, not just noise, but resistance. So the, the two fundamental things that go wrong with our body's electrical system are static and resistance. And so like when I'm moving the tuning fork through the biofield and I hit into charge or resistance in the field, 
that's an indication that in the body's electrical system, something is backed up. There's tension that's resulting in inflammation and that it's stopping cells in that neighborhood from optimal performance. And so as we clear the signal and we start to bring our own electric body into harmony and we get the resistance out of it, this is the blueprint for our physical body. And when we talk about being of sound mind and sound body, uh, to me, that's about having a clear, strong signal that is in flow. And when we experience that state, it's much easier to experience unity consciousness, to feel ourselves as one with nature, to be more informed by nature, to be in a state of internal rest more often where the body can repair itself and take care of all essential processes. When we have a lot of noise in our system and a lot of resistance, the body really struggles to keep itself whole and healed. And, you know, we've, we've been taught to come at these problems from a chemical mechanical standpoint, like you have low energy, well, take supplements. Uh, but what, what I found is that very often we have low energy because we've suppressed all of these emotions and we're holding ourselves back and down and in, we're not speaking our truth. We're not, um, we're not being authentic. <laughs> and so we want to address that at the level of the electrical body. It isn't something that we fix with pills. You know, I'd like to share a couple comments there if I could. Um, <clears throat> you spoke about rest. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that if we don't do what we need to do to manage our lifestyle such that we can come to an inner place of calm, in other words, we're conscious that we're not spending so much money that we're in debt all the time and forever chasing after more money and we're not getting entangled in silly arguments over things that don't matter, dot, 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 that we create a way of ritualizing ourselves so that we have the inherent stability to meet our biological needs and can manage ourselves so that we have enough time in the day to be present with ourselves. And when that center of stillness emerges, I believe from my own life experience and coaching thousands of people to this place that until we can actually reach that center, we don't actually have good listening skills at the level of soul. We're dependent upon the tympanic membrane for our listening. And it's interesting, Steiner's conception of the soul which I won't go into the great details of it, but he says anything with an inside and an outside has a soul. And so one of the ways I describe what a soul is and what spirit is to my students is I say, you've certainly all seen a drum or a shaman's drum. Well, the drum is receptive. The skin, the membrane is exactly what you have around every cell and your whole body's encased in fascia is the membrane that spirit plays. When you pick up the stick and start playing what comes through you, spirit is the flow of energy and information and inspiration that's playing the drum and soul is what's having the experience. And if we don't heal ourselves of the common obstructions to the flow of our own spirit to give ourselves permission to slow down and organize our lives so that we can have a spiritual practice, uh, whichever that may be for each individual. Then if you look, for example, at the effects of electricity or anxiety or uh, disruption of our biochemistry through poor diet, it causes our things like heart rate to speed up, breathing rate to speed up, thinking rate to speed up, i.e. anxiety. And those things actually have a palpable effect, not only on the tympanic membrane of our own hearing, but anyone that's been to an acupuncture uh, session and experienced needle grab, which occurs when the acupuncturist spins the needle, which excites the needle, and then excites the fascia and causes the fascia to contract because the fascia is 
an electret. So whenever we induce a current into fascia, it binds together more tightly. So what I'm saying is if we get ourselves to the point where we're adequately managed, which is why I created my four doctor model to break a living philosophy into four key elements. Doctor happiness is the domain of mind and being conscious of what's happy making for you and doing it. Doctor movement represents physical, emotional, and mental movement. Doctor diet represents what we feed ourselves physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And doctor quiet represents rest and introspection. Those four key things are the bedrock of holistic health and, and well-being. And when we honor those four aspects of ourselves and bring ourselves to the point where we have space in ourselves for listening and stillness, then I think the mysteries that you're speaking of become less mysterious and become accessible to us. Absolutely. The, yeah, the quieter you become, the more you hear, right? Ram Das. <laughs> and and it's true that, that, you know, when we're full of chatter and noise and stories and um, multiple voices in our head, we, we aren't able to experience that stillness and that discernment and experience. And that's really, you know, mental and emotional illness when we're full of storms and we can't settle. We can't can't find peace and rest because we have so many ants in our pants. So you wanted to know about OM and my take on OM. And consciousness. And consciousness. But those are two really big things to bite off. First of all, I will say that I'm, I'm not a Vedic scholar and that I haven't dove deeply into OM. Uh, it just brings me back around to cymatics and the idea of the creation of the beginning, the middle, the end, the, the idea that even in our body, we have cells that are creative and cells that are destructive and cells that are maintaining. And uh, the, 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 the sort of tr um, trinity of creation, which Ohm embodies uh, of the sound current. So I, I you know, I don't know that I can really say anything more than that that's meaningful in that department. I'm curious what you have to say about it, since it's a topic of interest to you. Well, I've studied it quite extensively, but I like to always get other people's opinion on things, especially fundamental principles. Om has uh, more than one meaning in the Vedas and in the Hindu scriptures. A U M underscore is ah, which symbolizes I awaken. Ooh symbolizes I'm dreaming. M mm, symbolizes I'm falling asleep. And underscore means end of cycle, complete silence, beginning of a new cycle. And then Om is also known as the sound of God singing or breathing uh, life into existence. Um, and, and from my understanding, they use sound in the same context that the Sufis do, not as audible sound, but as all possible frequencies from zero as no thing to infinity. Mm hmm yeah, so the the idea I know that it's also they they believe in these cycles of however many thousands of years where there's one entity that the, the exhale and the inhale you know, they're, they're sort of giving life to universes through the sound current through yes you know, the yugas yeah in the beginning was the word it's the same idea of a being vibrating the ether and setting up this movement of waves within it, which then gives rise to the multitudes of experiences and potentials. So the, 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 the sound current, you know, the, the creation of all being, being sound, I think it just kind of comes back to that. Yes. It's just such a lovely, uh, way of conceiving, you know, what I've studied my whole life on these topics and I'm sure you know well when you come across something that just rings your truth buzzer, even though you may not fully comprehend it 
scientifically or intellectually. There's something happening inside where you're, you know, as metaphor, your chakras line up and it feels as though you're, you're, you've heard the voice of truth. My studies of Ohm produce that truth buzzer for me. And, and when my soul gives me that sense of alignment, that's when I know I need to keep following that trail. Absolutely. You know, the truth has a ring to it. And when I started sharing my information with people about electric health, about the human biofield, about electric universe, about plasma and the ether, everybody says the same thing. They say, this makes sense. And, and I knew this, even though I didn't know that I knew it, that there's something about what you're saying that is lighting things up in me. And like you said, sort of bringing them into a kind of alignment and resonance that we really feel in our bodies. Like we know that's our knowing. And, you know, our knowing is something that I think has really been taken away from us. We've been told lots of lies that didn't ring true to us, but we were told by authorities that they were so. And so we, you know, many people have uninstalled their bullshit meters and are willing to listen to untruths and, and believe that they're so without noticing that it doesn't ring true. Uh, now more than ever. Look what's going on all around the world right now. Yeah, it's very hard to discern the signal from the noise in this sea of information that is currently out there. Yeah, yeah. I could go down a long segue here, but I won't bother because I've done it on many podcasts. So people already know my opinions about all of this, but I think it's a great time to really center ourselves and get together and hold hands and use our dreaming powers to create a reality for ourselves that's a lot more sustainable, holistic, and oriented toward love and sharing than owning and concealing and fencing off and that kind of silliness. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of distortion and a lot of noise in the collective signal that is gotten us off base from what our true nature is. I know that when I first started working with the tuning forks, and certainly as the years have gone by, what I've found more remarkable than anything is that when I help someone to get the noise out of their signal, and we amplify the clear tone that's underneath, that's inherent in us, what I see in everybody is this amazing greatness that Everyone on a, on a soul level, everyone on a fundamental level of their being is amazing and great and genius and gifted and full of light and beauty. Like everybody. I've never gone and worked in like psych wards or high security prisons, but I would imagine that even those people underneath their noise and their wounds and their bad programming have the same beautiful potential in them that on a fundamental level, when we are vibrating in our harmonious state, we're extraordinary beings and, and every single one of us is, and that's a very hard message to accept because we've really been told through our whole lives on every front that we're not good enough in some way or another. And most people are very plagued with stories, conscious or unconscious, about not being good enough and not being worthy. And because of that, they're not able to embrace their gifts and and to shine their light, quite frankly. Absolutely agree. In fact, in my studies of Greek philosophy, one of the correlates for the word soul is genie or genius. And you know, owning an educational institution and and having over 15,000 students worldwide, I know as a fact that every single human being on this planet is a genius. And all we've got to do to unlock that genius is listen to our heart and do the things we love to do and stop telling ourselves stories about how the fact that we're not going to make enough money if we do what we love to do. You know, glutathione is an extremely powerful antioxidant. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed on my YouTube videos from uh, a couple of years ago, I had a spot forming 
just below my left eye, which was the result of me doing so much research on herbs. And Angie, who is a nutritionist, said, you should try some glutathione. Maybe you need more antioxidant support. And literally day by day, I watched it disappear as soon as I started taking glutathione. But I didn't have the kind of glutathione that Symbiotica produces in their new Regenesis product. So I've got Shervin here to really explain what is unique about their new glutathione product. Shervin, what can we expect from Regenesis? Well, that's an interesting story, Paul, um, regarding that spot. And it just shows you exactly how strong glutathione is. We went out of our way. You know, it took us about 18 months to develop this, a lot of hard work. The entire team of scientists got together. And what we found was that most glutathions on the open market oxidize because of the sulfur compound that's attached to it. As soon as oxygen hits it, you get this sulfur you know, layout, which is very, very unpleasant. Our glutathione, which is liposomal, so it is protected, is bounded to lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is the, is the amino acid chain that makes colostrum colostrum. So this is our first non-vegan formula. It's still vegetarian, but it isn't vegan. Along with that, we have CoQ10, PQQ, which is pyroquinolone, which is a good brain nootropic, and lactobacillus rhamnosus, a human strain probiotic. All of these come together. It supports healthy intestinal tract, mitigates food environmental allergies, improves nerve growth factor, reinforces the immune system, neutralizes free radicals, antiviral, antibacterial, removes heavy metals, and just boosts the brain-gut relationship, which we know now is so critical to longevity and optimum health. This is truly one of our favorite, favorite formulas. Also, unlike a lot of supplements, it tastes very, very good. I was super <laughs> impressed when I tried it. Yeah, we find that to be very important. And again, we don't use anything artificial. Everything is organic. They're all extracts and there's zero sugar in any of our products. Awesome. So head on over to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. That's symbiotica.com. And on checkout, use your code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15, to get your 15% discount on Regenesis and any of the other amazing products at Symbiotica. Enjoy. And if you have spots on your skin, you might just get rid of them with this amazing product. I have had the great blessing of seeing the genius come out of people. For example, I'm an art therapist and I've turned literally thousands of people onto art, both in my workshops, in my advanced training through the Institute and in my private coaching sessions. And I have seen people that have never done art within six months to a year producing art that is so mind-bogglingly good. It's like you can't even believe that that person six months or a year ago was, was doing you know childish uh, stick figures on a piece of paper. And when a person has the right support and the right inspiration and feels safe to just play, I see magic happening and I'm very fortunate. I'm 59 now and at 54, I got a surprise and my second wife, I have two wives, Angie got pregnant with Mana and I really was like, oh my God, I am, I'm not, I don't want to be a daddy again, but I just, long story made short, went connected to the soul, asked, why do you want to be my child? Which just blew my mind. And then she got pregnant again. So at 59, I have a four and a half year old and a one and a half year old. And my sole focus and our sole focus is to give these kids every opportunity to explore whatever calls to them and let them find their own genius and not put them in a standard educational system. In fact, we're, we've already been using the Steiner system for Mana and we're going to get a Steiner homeschool teacher. But I think part of what's going on in the world is the need for an utter revamp of our educational system so the genius can come out. So absolutely. You know, and unfortunately school just does the opposite. <clears throat> it really does. It diminishes us and feeds us a lot of nonsense. And um, yeah, and people come out of the educational system broken. I know I did. I watched middle school destroy, just chew up and spit out both of my boys. 
Um, you know, especially our middle school approach is completely wrong. It's just completely wrong. So I hear you that we, we definitely need to overhaul education with the, with the assumption that everyone is a genius and they just need to be supported in what their what I call their awe. And, you know, this whole, one of the, the cornerstones of electric health in order to feed our electric body and be strong and bright is to follow our odds. So if you think about doing something and it feels light and uplifting and energizing and exciting and good, that's something that you want to do. But if you think about doing something and it feels heavy and you're doing it out of guilt or obligation, or, you know, just thinking that you don't have any other option, I call that an, uh, Yeah. (laughs) And so ideally we want to craft our lives to support our odds and we want to follow our odds. And and I know that's not always possible. I know that I went through a period in my life where I was taking care of a newborn baby and a a dying father and two businesses. (laughs) I, I certainly wasn't at liberty to go off pursuing my odds. I had a lot of Uggs that I had to do. But that time passed and I was able to start to reorient myself more in the direction of these odds. And that's where our gifts are, where our genius, where our brilliance is. You know, in my organization, we have about 35 people in my organization and I want everyone to be ha- following their odds and whatever they're doing because they're going to deliver the best product to me if it's an awe for them. Yes, I speak about this. Uh, in my Evolve Yourself series, which is which is a series of podcasts that starts with Evolve Yourself Physically, then Evolve Yourself Emotionally, then Evolve Yourself Mentally, Evolve Yourself Spiritually, and it finishes with Evolve Your Career. And I talk about periods in, in my life and in, in our lives as, as human beings where we do have things that come up. We do have obligations. I describe how You know, my first son was born when I just turned 18 and both my parents and her parents were broke and I had to go do any job I could get to put food on the table and pay the bills. And most of those jobs were not things that gave me an awe, but they were the things that made me go, ah, I can do this. I can make this happen. I can support my family. But I think if all of us that are, have been through one of those types of experiences you've just described and then reflect back on it later when we're in our awe. I've never seen anybody that cannot find some kind of pearl that was buried in that experience, even if it was the act of sacrificing yourself for love for people that you love and that need your love. So I think if whatever our conception of of God or source is, it's either one that supports us and realize, and we realize that all the experiences of our life are part of a process of a greater unfolding called self-realization. And even though they may be challenging and painful at the time, and we may not understand them if we're patient and we have faith, we come to find that meaning in either in the crisis or in the aftermath of coming back to our awe, which is often a newfound awe. But we ultimately come to realize that all the undulations and oftentimes the challenging parts were actually as essential to our growth in many ways as the awes were. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, in Barfield Tuning, we we don't use the words positive or negative. We don't look at experiences in somebody's past where they went through a really hard time. Uh, and, and things tend to happen in people's lives in clusters. We, our, our technical word for them in biofield tuning is shit storms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those, there's some big birds around here and they shit on you. <laughs> Yeah. And they, they tend to come in clusters for people where, you know, the house burns down and the dog dies and the kids all leave to go to college and the husband leaves the job, like all in the same year. And, um, and those experiences, we rise to meet them. It is in the difficult parts of our life that our character develops. I know that taking care of my son and taking care of my father uh, taught me a lot about patience and. You know, I remember having one day when he had 
made a mess of something and I had to clean it all up because, you know, he's old and losing it. And, and I wasn't happy. My son hadn't been sleeping all night, you know, for days and, and I was slamming things around. And my father said to me, he said, you know, you need to do the things that life asks of you in a state of grace. <laughs> uh, that's a w- wise words from daddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was the last thing that I was experiencing in that moment was, was a state of grace. But as we get older and we develop through these difficult things, it becomes easier and easier to manage stressors, to be in difficult situations in that state of grace. You know, it, for me, 20 years of being in the restaurant business taught me a whole lot about keeping cool under pressure. I'm sure it did, especially if it was in California where everybody has a thousand changes to the option. (laughs) No, it wasn't in California, but, you know, it was I owned a really busy restaurant that was, you know, we'd serve hundreds and hundreds of lunches at a time and just, you know, things going wrong constantly, walk ins breaking on Sunday, and you know, just constant difficulty and stress. And it felt miserable to go through. But coming out the other side of it, it gave me a really good stress threshold, right? Yeah. I mean, and and even the things when I've worked with people who have lost children, you know, really extreme things, I've lost multiple children, lost multiple loved ones all at once. And these things that break our heart wide open also have the potential to make us amazing people, to, to bring us to depths and breadths of our own experience that we never would have had you know, without that. And, and honestly, I've really come to see that life is really about contrast more than anything. And that we need to have this dark, difficult, contractive times in order to experience and appreciate the lighter, more expansive, happier times. Yeah. This is why Jung says no tree can grow to heaven unless its roots reach to hell. (laughs) It's a really good metaphor for it. Yeah. You want to stab at consciousness? Well, you know, that I'm not sure that I can do justice to the concept of consciousness. It, it, that's such a big conversation. I, I will say that one of the things that we have been told is that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain function <clears throat> and that, uh, that our physicality precedes our consciousness. Um, this is very illogical to me. Because when did the thought of a thing ever come after the thing? <laughs> ah, that's a good point. Yeah. Let's like Amit Goswami says, uh, consciousness was around long before brains emerged. Otherwise, there would be nothing in creation to make brains. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, I feel like that sort of little bit of misinformation right there is just a good illustration of all the falsehoods that we're told, you know, whether out of ignorance or intention of keeping us in the dark. Uh, Certainly, I find that what we call consciousness is connected to our, our bioplasma, our electric body. And that as long as we're alive, and our light is on, and our electric body is present, we have the pulse of life going through us, um, then we're conscious. And when we die, and that light goes out, our consciousness goes with it. So I definitely think that the ether, I think that all of life, the ground state of life itself is conscious and that, um, that there's, there's, you know, this whole notion that we're living with in, in our popular understanding of consciousness is very wrong and, and, and detrimental, you know, cause we're also told, we're told we have no soul. Our, our secular education is, has a soulless and also has us biofieldless. We're not taught about our electrical system. We're told that the idea that the body has a field is nonsense. And so there's this denial of, of soul, of consciousness, of life force that um, is part of our, our education, which is tragic, really. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so everything that's wrong with you can be fixed with one pill or another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it that's is all it's there all is. In, <laughs> that's right. All of this philosophy and cosmology that we're told is really in service in so many ways to take this pill. Yeah. 
you got to say though, it's a very genius marketing strategy between the the uh, what I call corporate religion strategies and and uh, the pharmaceutical industry. They've mastered brainwashing and sales to a very high degree. To a very high degree, brainwashing and sales, absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, my work is is really about um, helping us wake up to that and step back and widen the lens and take in information from a bigger picture. See, you know, see a, a, a wider perspective beyond this limited particle based chemical mechanical dark worldview we've been indoctrinated into that leads to depression and sickness and misery. And if we do everything that we're told, we end up in not a good place. And I find have found for me, in order to achieve the level of health and access to my own human potential, I've had to reinvent <laughs> the whole cosmological story. I've had to invent uh, a whole modality and develop a whole new lens of looking at life through that's actually empowering and more resonant in that truth realm that you and I were talking about earlier. Well, the the truth is, is uh, not but 150 or 200 years ago, you'd have been burned at the stake for doing what you're doing right now. Oh, I mean, I think that there's a good chance that I could be burned at the stake metaphorically even today because my new book that's coming out in two weeks, Paul, from the date you and I are talking, um, really, you know, cracks open all of this. And we talk about mind and consciousness and, and plasma and and our own illuminated electric bodies and how when we get this part, when we attend to this part of our physiology, of our beingness, then our physical body takes care of itself. And when you look at it, things from this perspective, you don't really need the pills. Yeah, well, if anyone comes to burn you at the stake, <laughs> call me quickly and I will uh, don my uh, remote viewer suit and come create havoc for them. <laughs> okay, I'll remember that, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that's lovely. You know, I, I'm digging these explorations and, and thank you for your statements on consciousness. I'm I'm going to reserve my own thoughts and feelings on that because we have so much to get through, but something that I've gone very deeply into in my spiritual practices and in the use of plant medicines and uh, my new book that I'm writing, which I will be happy to share with you as it uh, comes out, I think might uh, be fun for you to explore when I speak of what I've found out about consciousness through these practices and through a deep and long counseling session on this with my soul. But uh, when it comes to sound healing, most would have a limited conception of how sound influences the body and are only likely to perceive the influences of sound healing, regardless of the modality used as physical, as we've been discussing, largely due to our scientific materialist mindset. Can you talk a little bit about how sound influences for better or worse We've talked about the physical level, and now you've you've touched on some of these things. But what I'm really curious about is when you're using sound healing, we'll call it tuning forks, since that's the kind of the basis of your system. How do you perceive sound working through the physical, but also penetrating to the etheric, the astral, the mental? Um, layers, uh, y you know, because for a lot of people, as the scientific materialists don't believe those other things are there. But when you look at people like, uh, you know, William A. Tiller's research, it's pretty hard to turn a blind eye to it. <laughs> I mean, he's a very smart guy and he's got the math to support it. And then you've got someone who reminds me of you, Cindy Dale's books, which are excellent, and a myriad of others all giving solid scientific evidence for these levels. But to me, I feel that you could think of them like harmonics or octaves. And it seems to me from my own experience that if you're working even at the physical level, you cannot avoid influencing those other levels. So I'm just curious to hear in your own words, when you're doing a sound healing, how is it if you're standing next to a person's body, if you believe it is, 
that that treatment is actually accessing these other dimensions. And at some point, I'd like to just dialogue a little bit on Steiner's conception of the etheric field with you. I would agree with you in that they are all octaves or harmonics of the fundamental. So you the most gross, the you have the physical body that is vibrating on a particular wavelength bandwidth of frequencies. But then you have all of the higher harmonics of that as well. And that we, we can't separate them that there, you can't say this is separate from this or that it, it's all one in the same. I talk about the biofield being like an exploded view of the body and anything that's going on in the field, we find in the body and vice versa. So it's the at the the subtle level of the the atmosphere around the body, the body's magnetic field, the body's more subtle aspects. Um, a dissonance in one is a dissonance in all of them. Yeah. So when we're, what I'm working at is the at the the level of the entire system, because what makes tuning forks so useful is that they technically produce an infinite number of overtones. So I'm able to work at each level of that, the expression of the body up to these extremely, extremely high frequencies that are absolutely way beyond the inaudible range, um, that, that, that interaction of sound is happening. And using tuning forks with the body is really, it's a conversation. It's a call and response. I bounce sound off the body and I listen to the signal that comes back. I'm able to identify areas of noise in the signal and that could be anything from a false belief. For example, baby boomers who were in the population that was left to cry it out, right? They were going to be bottle fed on a schedule. And so these individuals are in their crib by themselves crying that they're hungry and want to be fed. And their mother is like, oh no, we can't spoil the baby. We have to wait another two hours until we feed him because we're feeding on a schedule. That baby forms the belief, it doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't matter that I'm asking for my needs to be met, they're not going to be met. And so that belief becomes part of the lens of our experience of life in our biofield. And when we talk to somebody, our tone of voice is carrying that belief. So if we really believe that it doesn't matter what I say, people are going to hear that in our tone and they're going to dismiss us. And we're going to go, see, it doesn't matter what I say. <laughs> we're just having that experience. So I can find that belief in your field. I can feel where it was formed. I can feel how it's informing your whole experience. It's very subtle and it's way in the past, but here it is. It's present. It's tangible. It's in a very specific place off the right side of your throat chakra, very close to the outer boundary of your field. That belief was formed, that story. And I can use the tuning fork to actually decompose it, to deconstruct that lens and, and shift that belief in someone, not just on the mental level, but on the level of their actual composition. Very interesting. I've, 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 of course, I've, I've, you know, I, I have used my own uh, time and approach to apply your system, not having been uh, formally trained by you or one of your instructors, but using my knowledge and just following your steps. And I'll remember the f I remember the first time I was moving a tuning fork through someone's field and the sound of the tuning fork changed. And I felt like all of a sudden I had hit dense air or uh, uh, like a magnetic obstruction, like a north on north experience. And I thought, God, all these years I've been using tuning forks and working on the body, but standing in the problem and not realizing it. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that interesting? I know, and and not having any idea, you know, that what you what really needs to be worked on is three feet away. Yeah, <laughs> very interesting. You know, um, out of curiosity, have you ever read the book Acroasis: The Theory of World Harmonics by Hans Kaiser? No, nope. it's a it's a rare book, and it's quite expensive. Mine cost me, I think, 
234 bucks. I was turned on to it by Ibrahim Karim, the founder of Biogeometry, who is an absolute genius of a man. I mean, this guy is highly spiritually evolved. He's an amazing scientist. He's an architect. He is mind blowing. If you listen to my podcast with him, it it went from first day to first place in the listening list within three weeks. It was it's so amazing. But uh, we've become friends, and that was one of the books he turned me on to to sort of get a basis for harmonics and understand some of the mechanics of sound and space. And uh, I'm bringing that up only because I I was curious if you'd read it, but um, in there he gives charts of all the harmonics and diagrams. And I found it was quite interesting that it all begins at zero and ends at infinity. So what I'm saying is, as I'm asking these questions about different levels, he shows clearly that all these harmonics are connected and they begin at zero and end at infinity, which, you know, put in Chinese would be begins in the Tao and ends in the Tao. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I've come to the same conclusions, you know, in my own in my own work that, you know, there's infinite overtones that are being expressed and that we are infinite beings. Absolutely. Uh, Eileen, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the etheric field and just get your description of it, but uh, then wanted to just take a moment to share uh, a couple of concepts from Steiner. How do you describe the etheric field? Well, you know, I never, in my forays through the field, I did not encounter that sense of gradient differences. So I know that Steiner and others uh, talk about the physical body, the causal body, the mental body, the astral body, the etheric body, and so on. My work didn't lead me into that framework. What my work showed me was that really it showed me the memories, the, the sort of conscious and unconscious mind as far as anatomy and vibrational language goes. So I never went very deeply into trying to understand those different bodies and what is assigned to them because they weren't really relevant to the information that I was encountering. You know, and only in that what we're saying is, is what we said earlier about these different bodies being different harmonics of all of the same system going from the low and gross to the high and fine. But as far as trying to tease out those different levels, the, it isn't really the road I went down. I, for me, it was more like, okay, I'm listening to this bit of noise. Um, what is it? Is it mental? Is it a, is it a tendency to run? the inner critic? Is it emotional? Is it is it gripping shame or frustration or sadness? Is there some kind of pathology going on in the physiology? Is that what I'm hearing? Is that grainy quality I'm hearing over this hip? Wow, that's actually arthritis. <laughs> so my work was much more geared towards um, understanding things in the context that I was encountering them. For example, certain noises in the field are like, that's a car accident. I know that sound. That's a, that is a relational problem. I know that sound. Um, this, this particular iteration of sadness is loneliness or keening or wailing. Like, that's more of the direction of my research is really understanding um, this vibrational language and how it gets expressed in the biofield. So the more esoteric pursuits of like, the, you know, what is etheric, what is astral, what is mental, what do they all apply to, isn't really a road I've gone down much. Yeah, that's all. You know, I don't, I don't think those things are critical because having studied a lot of different authors and done countless workshops and things like uh, a week long workshop on the nine Egyptian light bodies and many, many other things, I find that. Uh, you can go to the Taoist model with three chakras, the Hindu model with seven, and there's Egyptian models ranging from 11 to 13 to 21 chakras. There's 
I think really what it is, it's just like how different people and therefore minds break up the construct of the whole to fit their own perceptual model. Um, so I think that that each of us has to or probably should follow the path that we're being led down, which is exactly what you're saying. And I think that's important. Um, Steiner's description of the etheric body, which can be hard to understand, but I have 170 something Steiner books. So I've had a chance to really spend years and years and years working through his model to finally get to what he's really saying. And and really what Steiner describes is the etheric body is the etheric body is the interface between the mental and the astral chakra. The etheric chakra taps into our meridians and our nadis and 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 becomes the source of energy and information that's guiding our cells. But what's interesting is that the etheric body is created by the sum total of our biochemical reactions. And one of the ways I demonstrate this to some of my students is I say, okay, here, here's a bowl of water, take a pendulum, hold it in your hand and measure the energy in this water. And they'll, you know, the pendulum will start swinging. And I then take a teaspoon of salt, throw it in the water and stir it and say, now measure it. And they'll notice immediately that the energy is significantly greater due to the interaction chemically with the salt. And you could do it with anything, but Nassim Harriman recently said there are 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second in the human body. I've got physiology texts saying that there are about 10 billion biochemical reactions, but those books were written in the probably the late 80s and weren't probably looking at it near as scientifically as Harriman is. But really, when you think of the concept of a standing wave and 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second, each of them, which is going to have an electric tone, if you will, it's going to produce a harmonic and, and a, or a standing wave. And I think that because the etheric body is so heavily linked to our biochemistry, which is so heavily linked to our diet, our lifestyle, our breathing, um, you know, I'm, of course, it's it's. In my institute, I teach six foundation principles, the feminine or nutrition, hydration and sleep and the masculine or breathing, thinking and movement, all of which can influence every one of those bodies. But because the etheric body is driven by our biochemical interactions, I think that it's a real important uh, thing that we need to be aware of as healers. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying from the perspective of a sound healer, I'm just simply saying that when a person's diet and lifestyle is out of balance, they're going to have low vitality or what a, a Chinese medicine practitioner would call low chi. And that's going to change their overall harmonics. And, and this is where, for example, using tuning forks could give somebody a vibrational boost that might actually give them enough energy to begin a change, a behavioral change process where, you know, for example, Someone addicted to sugar, Candace Pert said sugar is as addictive as morphine or heroin and should be classified as a type one drug. But when you look at how many people are addicted to sugar, how destructive it is to the body, that will lower the vibration in the etheric field because it's actually depleting the cells of tremendous amounts of nutrition, bringing the pH balance of the body to acid, causing hyperventilation to try to alkalinize the blood. So right away, you're going to see a significant shift in vitality and telling people what to eat and how to live is easy. It's never the information that's the problem. It's the behavior change. So from Steiner's conception and, and, and knowing what you're doing with the tuning forks, my point in wanting to bring it up was to just discuss your thoughts on Steiner's conception, but also to say that I find that using sound frequencies, tuning forks, Tibetan bowls, chanting, toning, singing, um, all are easy ways anybody can use to bring one into a higher vibrational state, which I find is essential for people that are in the uh, initial phase of behavior change, because a lot of them 
are low energy people. And as I'm sure you would agree, behavioral change takes quite a bit of energy. You've got to override your unconscious habits and consciousness, uh, awareness of what you're doing and choosing takes a lot of energy. Research shows the brain consumes 80% of the available blood sugar at any moment it's cognitively engaged. So just from a physiological perspective, to use your brain to create behavioral change takes a lot of energy. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities for people if they realize that the foods they put in their mouth and the liquids they drink and the way they manage themselves has a huge impact on the life force energy in their cells. And, and that has a lot of impact on whether or not you have the energy and the vitality to effectively change your mind. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that, that, you know, the thing that I discovered that I was treating the most in people after, after decades of being in practice and reflecting was that, I seem to be helping people with stuckness that were stuck in some particular way. And very often after a busy day in the clinic, I'd come home and I'd feel kind of like a tow truck driver that had spent my day pulling people out of ditches. And the kinds of ditches we get stuck in are actually wiring. They're the circuitry of what is happening in our brain and our body. Unfortunately, pathways that get laid down early become the pathways of our lives. And we become hardwired into particular patterns of behavior, action, thought, belief, story. And, and to change that, to, to dig a new canal, if you will, and to, to shift the way that energy habitually moves through our minds, through our emotions and our bodies, is actually a tremendous amount of work. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. It's very, very hard. And it's very hard to do from the inside out. And certainly people figure out ways to do it. But that's one of the ways that biofield tuning comes in very handy because, because magnetic fields guide and inform electric currents. So, for example, if you have a habit of self-sabotage, there is a very specific pattern of imbalance in your wiring, in the way that electricity is flowing through your system, that I can actually find and move. I can rearrange your wiring by manipulating the magnetic field. I can change the way, the patterns, the rhythms, and the flows of electricity through the body. Now, and there's no separating the body, the mind, the biofield, all of those different levels. They're all one and the same. So Again, coming back to this sound body, sound mind idea that we can't experience these higher, more refined, um, maybe even more noble aspects of our being unless our physical body is in order as well. And that a health, that, that there's no separating spiritual health from physical health. No, I agree 100%. It's, uh, I've, are you familiar with the law of facilitation and physiology? No. I'm going to share it with you because it explains why it is that when people have repeated thought patterns and behaviors, it makes it very hard for them to change. The law of facilitation says when an impulse passes once through a given set of neurons to the exclusion of others, it tends to do so on a future occasion. And each time it traverses this path, the resistance will be smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So really, part of healing is becoming aware of the thoughts and the beliefs that spawn them and saying, are these beliefs and thoughts and the behaviors born of them producing what I want in my life? And if the answer is no, and we keep doing it, then I say, people, you, you might want to come to the awareness that you may have an addiction. And I define an addiction as any repeated behavior that does not produce the results you want. And why this is important is because we know, and you and I both know, that changing behavior is not easy and getting over addictions is not easy, but what you're presenting us with is a technology 
that can not only dissolve some of these thought patterns that have been crystallized into our field, but can also give us the energy through the sound healing to awaken and to have the energy to really look carefully at what we're creating and become more aware of it and begin the transformative process. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about sound healing in general, but your approach is so magnificent because it, it, it using your model, which I have your chart sitting right here, you can actually find these things and they become tangible, objective things, just like a file on a hard drive that you can delete or move to a different section of the hard drive. And I've practiced using your technique of dragging some of these heavy files into the midline and into the microcosmic orbit and letting go, letting them go back and to be reintegrated. And I've seen people change immediately. I mean, get off the table and go look at me like, what did you just do? <laughs> you have to yeah. thank this lady named yeah, Eileen David Cusick for that. <laughs> yeah, that whole metaphor like dragging the files, you know, I mean, that that's exactly what it is. We're we're all loaded up with all these heavy files that can be transmuted and that the energy that is stuck in them that's working against us can be liberated and start to work for us. And in in doing that, you know, in going through the system and finding all these old files and freeing up bandwidth, it, you become much more creative you become much more free. You start to find creative solutions to old problems. Um, you become lighter. You know, that's certainly been my experience. I've been receiving sessions for 10 years now, both from students and also in these groups that I conduct. Um, my practice became so busy that I, I just couldn't see people one-on-one -on -one anymore, even though I was in the middle of nowhere in rural Vermont. And um, I switched to a group method where, and I've actually recorded hundreds of these group sessions that you can find on biofieldtuning.com about all, all kinds of things, working on different organs and different systems and different emotions. And what I would do is create a hologram on the table of everyone who was listening to live and everyone who would ever listen to the recording. And I put myself in that hologram as well so that I would receive the benefits. and. I, you know, so between my individual sessions that I've received from students and then all of these group sessions, I've received over 500 biofield tuning sessions. And my transformation has been dramatic. I went from being um, broke, overweight, in debt, miserable, fighting with my husband all the time, domestic discomfort. Um, I had planter's warts on my feet. I had the most miserable digestion you could imagine, you know, gas, bloating, heartburn, indigestion. Uh, I was full of limiting beliefs and stories. And as I started to receive tuning and I started to understand this electric health concept that I now live by, um, I'm 52 now and I have, a, I have a heart quest heart rate variability system. And I pulled it out a couple of days ago and I did a scan of myself and I hadn't done one in two years. And the scan said that, um, my biological age is actually 32 It's 20 years younger than my physical age. Um, I have no issues. I have no pain. I can eat anything and my digestive fire incinerates it. Um, I am out of debt. I, I have so much more freedom now and I have an experience and this is exciting call. I finally started having the energy and the focus to start going to the gym for the first time in my life. And at 52, finally accomplished being able to do a pull up for the very first time in my life. And since I've been able to do that, I, I put up a pull up bar in my bedroom door and I'm up to six. I can do six pull-ups. This morning at the gym, I had an experience of really connecting with my core on this very deep level in an electric way, in a wiring way. Because part of my disorder was having experiences that caused me to um, disassociate from my body. And so I went through my entire life 
as a, you know, picked last in the gym going to school. I was on JV soccer for four years in high school. I was never an athlete. I was never connected to my core. My brain had divorced itself from my core because of trauma. And it has taken so long to get that wiring back going again. Um, and it is through the use of sound, also through the use of a tuning fork that I invented called the sonic slider. And the sonic slider, when paired with a circuit boot, I don't know if this is something you have yet, Paul. If you don't, I definitely I don't. have to get you one. Yeah, I'd love it. I got to get you my book too. <laughs> yeah, we're going to send all this stuff back and forth. Um, using the sonic slider and imparting this mechanical energy into my musculature, uh, finally started connecting my brain to my body so that when I started going to the gym, I wasn't just going through the motions and not feeling anything. I was actually experiencing my body, my core from the inside out for the first time in my life that I finally got this wiring straight out. In fact, this morning I was able to make a jump from doing only being able to do 15 pushups to being able to do 20 pushups. Um, because I, because I really that wiring really connected in my core. And so this, my whole healing process has been one of descending into my own body and discovering the bliss potential of occupying a body that is healthy, that is pain-free, and that is anatomically functional in the way that a body is supposed to be. And that has lifted my heart, my soul, my mind, and everything. So there's no separation. Yeah, congratulations. That's that's great. And I, it doesn't matter what age that happens. It's still a great thing to celebrate. 52 or 92, it's, you know, when you really find yourself centered in your body and realize how magical it is. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen the book um, Stalking the Wild Pendulum by Itzhak Bentov, but it's one of my all-time favorites. He shows with great diagrams how the human consciousness and human being connects to everything from atoms all the way up to God. It's got one incredible range of frequency reception. And, uh, you know, when we're, when we're in a healthy body, we, if you think of the body as an antenna, we actually have the capacity to have a relationship with all that exists out there, which is really quite phenomenal when you, think of a how magical the human body is but when you look at how badly treat their, people treat their bodies and all the religious stigma around the body and the shaming and the especially women's bodies in christianity it's it's just like people keep going to churches to find god i say you don't need to go to a church you're in the church take care of it don't pay money to clean somebody else's building start with your own <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because our bodies are composed of the molecules of creation. And, and if you think about coming back to the ether idea that, you know, I'm composed of ether, then m the best way to worship creation is through the handy vehicle of my own body. <laughs> Exactly. It's there. You know, it's real for sure. You wake up with it. You go to sleep with it. You said something a, a bit ago. You you said something. You said creating a hologram. So are you doing this as a psychic projection or how? what do you mean when you say you're creating a hologram? You know, it's so simple. It's really just a thought. And this is something that I discovered working with sound. In fact, I really discovered it when I brought on my first two apprentices before I started teaching, I had uh, apprentices working with me and we, we met weekly and we're kind of contemplating everything. And what we really came out of our studies together was this awareness of how intention is so powerful and so simple. You know, you think about walking through an airport. The reason why we don't run into each other or any kind of busy environment is because we're all projecting the very clear intention, I'm going this way. <laughs> and so, so intention isn't some mystery. You know, it's very clear. You have a thought and you project that thought and your body follows it. So I'll, all I do is I have the very simple thought that there is an invisible hologram on my table and it contains the biofields, the data points of every single individual who will ever come into contact with this information. 
And then it's so. And it's really that simple. Or if I'm working on one individual, I'm just like, this is the hologram of of Paul. And then I'll get to it. And then your information will show up. I can command the ether with simple, clear. Yes, I understand that concept. Uh, I use uh, that same approach, but with slightly different words. But uh, for example, when I'm doing healing work with somebody at a distance, I'll just go into meditation and draw a silhouette of their body. And then I will hone my, I'll connect to their soul and I'll just ask their soul to guide me where I need to direct my awareness and attention. So it's like a map of their body. And then I, I follow what my, well, it's their soul talking to me through my soul. And they, then I, that way I just have some sort of a, a visual as to where I need to look or what questions I need to ask. I was just questioning, you know, you mentioned the word intention. I'd like to share with you what I share with my students, what intention is. Do you have any observations on exactly what intention is or how it manifests? Well, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. (laughs) Well, you see, in my model, source is a zero force. And the only form of love that could represent God would be unconditional love. And anything unconditional can only be symbolized as zero because it's paradoxically by having no conditions, it's no thing and simultaneously everything. And because unconditional love is pure potential, it's the source from which all things created emerge. So I tell people, you have access to pretty much anything that you want if you're willing to put your focus on it and open your mental pathways to receive it and embody it. So what I tell people is that source as unconditional love is pure potential. And whenever you have a dream goal or objective, you take pure potential and put it into tension. So what you're doing is taking something, and the way I describe it to my students is I say, if you look at the Tai Chi symbol, the S line created between yin and yang is the zero point. The feminine is the negative potential or the yin, and the masculine is the yang or the masculine potential. But those complementary opposites are in basically in a state of equanimity at the level of unconditional love. But when you have a dream, goal, or objective, or even a thought, you are putting potential or unconditional love into tension, and you are now creating a charged relationship where energy flows from source into whatever it is that you're creating consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a pathway for that energy to flow along. Yeah, it's just like... uh, when you plug something into the wall, you can turn it on because it's now in tension with the electrical grid. So it's really basically taking pure potential and putting it into tension, which means that there's now a dynamic relationship between the two polarities of unconditional love, no thing, yin, everything, yang. Hmm. I love the that way the play on words, right? About intention. <laughs> yes. Well, my soul teaches me these things a lot. And one of the things my soul has taught me is that coded within every word is is what it actually means. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but but I mean that at a at, at a deep level, like I've just shared. Yep. Yep. I agree. I and anytime I've talked with anybody who's really familiar with word etymology. Um, they, there's, they always say such clever and mind blowing things. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. But now that you say it, it makes so much sense. Yes. I actually have a woman coming on the podcast, uh, pretty soon. Who's that's her expertise is the etymology of words. And she's a very powerful human being that writes some mind blowing poetry based on the meanings of words. So you'll have to keep your ears out for that when I'm my, I'm brain farting on her name right now. But if, uh, if I think of it, I'll email it to you. I'll see if I can find one of her videos that's just wickedly mind blowing. It's so powerful. There's no power in words that we don't that we don't respect. I think absolutely yes. 
You know, one of the the key pieces of this whole idea of sound therapy to me it isn't about just the tones I'm putting into you with tuning forks, but the words that you're saying and the thoughts that you're thinking and the tone that you're thinking and speaking with are all incredibly creative. And people don't realize when they say things like, I am fat, I am broke, I am blah, 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 that they are creating that reality through their words. That's an ineffective use of cymatics. Absolutely. Yeah, and intention too. Yes, and I tell people all the time, be careful what you wish for and watch what you think because the answer is always yes from unconditional love because by definition, to say no is to create a condition. So every thought is a prayer. Every word is a prayer. And I, I encourage all my students to be conscious of the power of your thoughts and words because God's willing to experience anything and everything because it's the only way God can come to know itself and God's not afraid to die. So trips into the darkness are nothing new for God. But my experience of God is that God's much more excited about experiencing connection, wholeness, love, because the dark side's been experienced quite a lot, as most of us know. So if you're going to use your mind and you're going to use your word, you might as well use it to create what you want to engage within yourself and others. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be really diligent about that, you know, to be really thorough, to not just be 50% of the time I'm mindful and 50% of the time I'm not, that we really want to do our best to speak words filled with power and conscious intention in order to really consciously create. And, you know, this is a big part of how the world is going to unfold in the next few decades. We're going to speak it into being collectively. And are we speaking noise and, and nonsense or are we speaking clear signals and resonance and, and cooperation? And are we making a cacophony or are we making music together? And I'd like to believe that it's possible for us to get in tune individually and collectively enough that we can make music together in our culture. If a million of us can get on that frequency wave together, we can actually do what you're doing with a tuning fork and create a quantum jump where all of a sudden people start waking up to things and having realizations that occur in them spontaneously without any effort. And all of a sudden we can see a movement toward harmony. Yeah. I call that spontaneous emergent coherence. Yay. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the effects of a great lovemaking session to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's born out of that unconditional love that you're, you're talking about the, the, the you know, spontaneous arising because we're all, we all share the morphic field of humanity. We, you we know, do. We are all connected in Carl Jung's collective unconscious. And as things shift in the collective, then they arise into the consciousness of people spontaneously. Um, I think there is a sea change taking place. I, I definitely noticed one after 2012, honestly. Having been in this field and encountered a lot of skepticism over the years, I definitely found that after 2012, and I don't know what exactly happened then, um, suddenly people were more open-minded. And I think we're going to find the same thing going into 2021, you know, after uh, Jupiter and Saturn have gone into Aquarius and we've activated all this Aquarian wave energy, that people are just going to be much more open-minded towards things like vibrational healing, biofields, the ether, <laughs> all of these sort of Aquarian concepts that are going to be much easier for people to hear and to receive than, you know, they were back in 96 when I started on this journey. Yes, and, and indeed, and we're also having a the third, it's what's now called the third wave of, of psychedelic revival and I think properly used plant medicines in a ceremonial setting done correctly 
can enhance a person's perceptual awareness to subtle energies to the point that what was a sort of a flat, boring material world all of a sudden shows itself to you. She undresses for you. And I think that the third wave of psychedelics and all the research going on now and the fact that places like Colorado have decriminalized mushrooms and the whole movement of marijuana. I mean, yes, it has to be used intelligently, but I think that that's actually mother nature reaching out to us to say, wake up. Here is the medicine. You're walking on it. Your, your, your medicine chest is here. Use it intelligently and grow up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know for me that psychedelics introduced me into a visceral experience of unity consciousness. And I think that having contemplated the mess here on the planet and humanity, if we boil it down to just one thing, you could say that it's the illusion of separation that has us divided against each other. And that if you simply heal that illusion of separation, then that heals a lot of other ills in the process. And so certainly um, psychedelics, open up us up to that possibility. And and I think this new way of thinking electrically, that o- opening up what I talk about in my next book, Electric Body, Electric Health, and I talk about in Tuning the Human Biofield as well, that when we start to open up to these additional states of matter, um, plasma and ether, you know, suddenly we have um, an awareness of that which connects us instead of living in this separate disparate world that we've all been in. So I think we're moving in the right direction, but uh, (laughs) there's still a lot of junk in the way. Yeah. Well, you know, I tell my students, you know, the reason people are so slow to wake up on this planet is because there's no rush to become enlightened. And then I tell them the story that Joseph Campbell tells about the Hindu deity that got cocky and and was building mansion after mansion after mansion. And his carpenter got so so tired, he went and complained to God. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, do you know this story? No, I don't don't think I do. Oh, it's lovely. Um, He said, uh, you know, Indras are gods in Hinduism and he says, oh, uh, I'm, I'm working for this Indra, and he just he just wants me to build mansion. He says, for my whole life, I've been doing nothing. He's got these mansions. He's never going to live in all over. He goes, would you tell this guy that's, you know, there's other things you can do with God, God consciousness than just build mansions? And so uh, God sends a message to him, and I can't remember who shows up, but some deity shows up. And uh, says to him, oh, I hear from your carpenter that you keep building mansion after mansion after mansion. And uh, he says, what are you going to do when you're enlightened? And I'm totally forgetting the exact sequence, but the punchline is there. He says, well, you know, I'm going to become enlightened. And, and, and the guy says, well, then what? And the, the, the deity just the, the, this Indra looked at him and, and just sort of had a blank look. And all of a sudden, thousands of ants begin to crawl across the floor in his mansion. And he's looking at the floor like, where are all these ants coming from? And this deity that brought him the message pointed to them and said, Indra's all. In other words, the punchline is once you merge into unconditional love, i.e. reach nirvana, you can pop out anywhere in God's creation and the whole show just starts again. So the message to the guy was, you're building all these monuments to to being a deity, but the truth is you're really at the same level of an ant because once you become one with God, you may next be an ant, a rock, or a stone. (laughs) And I saw it was so cute. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we're all all of that too, you know, on a certain level because we're one with everything, right? On yes, a, on a very level. Absolutely, and and I I think it's I think it's all beautiful if we reach a point in our life where we start looking for the beauty instead of looking for the next problem. Yes, you know I I, I live by that. I think 
to me, beauty is so important. And one of my, one of my hobbies is, is phone photography. I, I take a lot of pictures and, um, I'm always on the lookout for beauty in, in people, in, in anything, in any situation that, you know, walking the beauty path where that, that's what you seek and that's what you bring out in people. Uh, I, you know, I really believe that every single person has this potential for beauty in them. And when I look at people, that's what I look for. And, and as a consequence, that's what I bring out in people. And somebody said to me, I, I recently posted a photograph um, and, and somebody said that I looked so happy and so radiant. And how was that possible with the world being what it is? And she said, my face just reflects the sadness that I'm feeling because everything is a mess. And it's really up to us where we're going to put our focus. Are you going to put your focus on the news, on the stories, on the media manipulation? And are you going to have that inform your health and your perception of the world? Or are you going to be hungry for beauty and looking at it and seeing it and appreciating it everywhere that you can? Even in something as simple as I put just the right amount of honey in this cup of tea. And I am so immersed in the beauty of this perfect cup of tea in this moment. It's that simple. It's really so much of life comes down to all of these little things. And those little things, we can, we can bring beauty to those moments. Or we can, you know, so we, it, it's up to each and every one of us to make the world more beautiful by choosing to look for the beauty that's already there and, and expanding it and believing in it and feeding it. Amen. I am totally 100% with you. Um, I was curious. I interviewed Walt Thornhill twice. And one of the things he said was that there's no such thing as a photon. And he was a bit negative toward me when I was talking about photons, kind of like blowing it out of the room, like, you know, whatever. And for me, having studied so much on light and, and there's so much out there. And then as I was preparing for our interview, I'm like, well, Eileen Day McCusick is one of the Electric Universe people. And I know she knows Walt because Walt's the one that connected me to her. So my question is, how do you counterbalance Walt's concept of the photon and your use of the term photon in your own book? Well, there's also people that say there's no such thing as an electron. I mean, if everything is waves, then this idea of particles are particles are really an artifact of our human perception. Our eyes, our ears, we our, our sensory organs reduce waves to particles. Uh, photons are probably just nodes in in waves uh, and don't exist as separate entities. Same with electrons. Um, I we we do use the terms like, for example, I did research when I was working on my PhD at the California Institute for Human Science, they have a biophoton counter. Uh-huh. That's exactly what I brought up with Walt Thornhill, and he pretty much just dismissed it like it was just made up or something, and I was really shocked. Yeah, I, I think that like the biophoton counter actually counts the number of photons that uh, are allegedly being emitted. And in the little study that I did with them, we found that biofield tuning reduced biophoton emission uh, considerably, which was what I anticipated would happen. Which is reducing decay, basically. Yeah, reducing decay, exactly. That we lose light when we are under stress. And when we are coherent and balanced, we conserve light, we conserve energy. So, you know, the I think that it's important that we use language like photons and electrons and to talk about concepts while understanding that fundamentally everything is waves. And I think that that's where Wall is coming from, is this idea that photons, electrons, these sorts of things are, are simply artifacts of perception and don't, in fact, exist as as discrete entities. Yeah, okay, well... He, he basically said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, that 
what you're seeing is the effects of an electric charge. And I'm like, I agree with that. But I described how Fritz Albert Pop's research assistant created the first uh, photon counter capable of counting single photons and talked about biophotons. And then I, you know, also said, what about all the quantum double slit experiments and all of that? But he was saying there's no real, there's no such thing as a photon. It's just an electric field. The photon is, um, I can't remember the words he used, but basically he was saying it, it's just the product of the electrical field, but a photon is the product of an electric light as well. Um, so I think I, I just figured since you had the electric universe concepts well in your soul, but you also were using photons at various points in your book, I was just curious to get your take on it because you're you're able to put one foot in both sort of mindsets, so to speak. So I appreciate uh, you sharing that. I think that I can better understand Walt's position after hearing your uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you, you think about uh, when I was doing research from my thesis and that, that became tuning the human biofield and I came across uh Fritz Albert Pop's work and the biophotons and the biophoton counters. And it made a lot of sense to me because I was trying to understand like, what is it that I'm finding in the field? Like, I know I can call this chi, but you and I both found that resistance, that electrical resistance in the field. That's not a sufficient term for me as a Westerner to use. And then when I discovered that we lose light when we're under stress and that these areas were memories of when we had been under stress, that there was actually charge there. Now, can we call them photons? Can we call them free electrons? Can we call them bioplasma? Wall might say that it's the electromagnetic field. He once can call these clusters in the field congealed ether, <laughs> which I thought was an interesting phrase to describe them. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that it is that they're, they're really... I'm fairly certain there are no particles that, you know, there are just, there's, there's charge, there's, there's fields, um, there's force, but the idea that, that a particle exists purely comes from our sense, our perception, our, our instruments of perception. Yeah. And I think because we know that an atom isn't a thing like it used to be thought of, it's really a cloud of possibilities, but here we are. And what is an atom? It's entangled light. But I think that we have become so conditioned to mountains and stars and trees and houses and objects that it's hard for us to depart from the particle concept because everything we see in the material world seems to be um, a collection or a mass of aggregates of some type of, you know, what is cement? It's an aggregate. What is a mountain or stone? It's an aggregate. So when we realize that behind that, the, the dream weaver is winding light together to create the illusion of particulate mass but it really is an amazing illusion <laughs> right. it's light when it comes right down to it it's all just fluctuations in this unified field of light and that yeah that you know that that the way that you described it is 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 beautiful i think that that's a great way to explain it well thanks there's a little myth and a little common sense in there eileen i could talk to you forever um, and I'm really grateful that you've shared with us today and what a great journey into biofield tuning and the unique characteristics of your system, which I really love because having studied the other systems, the things that makes yours unique is all these things we've talked about with the field, the understanding of plasma and ether and the ability to identify where in a person's field obstructions are that block them from being the genius that they really are and seeing the beauty in the world and the fact that it can be done as a, at a distance because we're really all one. I think there's a tremendous amount of freedom being offered to people. And the fact that your practitioners work remotely, and I know it works very well because several people that I've 
turned on to your practitioners have had to work remotely and got great results with it. Um, where can people learn more about you? I'm sure your book, Tuning the Human Biofield Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy, is available on Amazon. Um, wh- what uh, would you like to do to direct people to uh, other courses, resources, or anything that you'd like to offer? And if you have any discounts for listeners, feel free to share. Or if you've already arranged that with Penny, she'll share it. Well, most of everything that you would want to access is at biofieldtuning.com. And you can buy very high quality sound therapy tools that I have invented and developed over the years, a variety of different tuning forks. Um, The recordings of these group sessions, there's lots of those to choose from. We also have practitioners all over the world and hundreds of them and thousands of students worldwide at the moment. And so we have a listing and you can go through and see who appeals to you if there's somebody nearby or everyone is trained to do the work at a distance. So that's an option. Um, I have quite a number of different YouTube videos that you can watch at, um, at my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search my name and you'll find us there. Uh, we're also on Instagram and on Facebook. So if anybody wants to follow, I, I share uh, a lot of information about uh, this idea of electric health. So that's my next book. And I'm not sure when this is airing, Paul, but it will probably be released by then. It's January 26, 2021. Electric Body, Electric Health comes out on uh, paperback, Kindle, and Audible. And um, both my books are on Audible. I narrated both of them. So if you're more of a book listener, that's an option for you. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah. So those are those are all the places where you can go to learn more. Is your new book available on or for pre-purchase on Amazon? Yes, it's available right now. In fact, we're encouraging people to pre-purchase it. So. Yeah, I'm going to do that as soon as I get finished with you. Awesome. So, and uh, once I read it uh, and can take some notes and put together a dialogue, I would love to do a podcast with you to talk about it. Yeah, I would love that. It's it's about the nature of our, our electric health and the primary thing that I have found which affects our health, which is our emotions, quite honestly. And there's quite a lot in this book on all the different emotions where we feel them and experience them in our body. And what to do with them, because we're not really taught proper emotional management. We're taught suppression and denial and pills and sugar and things like that. And so healthy emotional management is really a, a keystone to good health. And, and the in this model, you learn where different emotions show up in different parts of your body and how to bring your biofield into balance from the inside out in order to help to heal yourself by managing your emotions better. So there's, there's quite a lot of information on that. Yeah. Very exciting. I can't wait to get my hands on that. And I'll probably, I normally listen to books and buy the hard copies just so I can refer to diagrams, scribble in the book, take notes and things like that. So I'm going to listen to you and read you and enjoy every minute of it. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to talk to you after you've done all that, Paul. That sounds great. Yeah, lots of love. Okay, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this amazing podcast with an amazing woman, Eileen Day McCusick. And thank you for anything that you buy from our sponsors. They all have, as you hear me say on every podcast, beautiful values that are aligned with my own. And anytime you buy something from the sponsors, you're doing two amazing things. You're giving yourself a great product and you're supporting the world because these are all sustainable Uh, companies that use sustainable farming practices. And the third magical thing you're doing is supporting me so I can keep doing the podcast and finding amazing guests like Eileen. So lots of love to all of you. Check Eileen's work out. It works. It's amazing. Her book is awesome. Her videos, there's lots on her YouTube channel. Get yourself into some of her training if you're a health professional or a massage therapist or anybody that wants to help people find their genius. And I look forward to sharing a lot more with all of you soon. Eileen, thanks for all the love you share with the world. Thanks, Paul. And you too. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Eileen Day McCusick. You can visit the Biofield website at biofieldtuning.com and also electrichealth.com. Connect with Eileen on Facebook and Instagram at Biofield Tuning and on her personal Instagram at Eileen McCusick. That's spelled E I L E E N M C K U S I C K. She also has a YouTube channel at Eileen Day McCusick. Eileen is giving Paul's listeners a bonus free video session called The Knees Getting Unstuck, which you can find at bit.ly forward slash Eileen's bonus video. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Eileen's bonus video. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com.